Over the last week and a half, we have been focusing on sounds and looking at a kind of phonological abstraction that we called a phony. Here we're going to focus on another type of phonological abstraction that we're going to call a syllable. And before we begin, here's a little IPA challenge. This is a word in English transcribed into IPA. Can you read this word and tell us what it is? Please pause the video. This English word is Alabama. So you can see the dots here are separating the syllables of the word. We don't usually need to put uh, dots in between syllables, but they can be added if you want to emphasize the separation between the syllables in the International Phonetic Alphabet. So we have one, two, three, four. Alabama. Indeed, this word has four syllables. And we all know syllables because they teach them to us in school. Uh, they probably taught you something like you should clap and see how many claps you can get into a word, and that's how many syllables you have. Alabama. Maybe they told you that you have as many syllables as you have vowels. So this word has Alabama. Four groups of vowels, which match the four syllables that we have. Uh, by the way, a quick reminder, words in English have stress, and stress is really a property of syllables. So in this word, Alabama, the stress syllable is the penultimate syllable, the one that's before the last one, Alabama. If an English word is long enough, uh, four syllables or more, it's also going to have something called secondary stress, which we indicate with this little stroke here, before the syllable with the secondary stress. So this syllable, the uh, has it also has an increase in uh, prominence, but not as much as the one with the primary stress. So you have Alabama, but it does have a rise in prominence. You can't just say it with the same flatness as you would this one. You can't say Alabama. You need to say Alabama is the word. So words in English have secondary stress and primary stress, which is assigned to the syllable. And by the way, syllables interact with the phonemes of English. And one of the main interactions they have is that unstressed syllables accept less uh, vowels. There's fewer vowels that can go into unstressed syllables. As a matter of fact, most unstressed syllables in English are just just have the vowel schwa. So this word needs to be Alabama. You can't have, for example, a tense vowel here. You can't have an a. Ah. You cannot say this word Alabama. Uh, that would sound really weird. So unstressed syllables in English usually have the schwa as their vowel. All right. So we've all sort of studied syllables. Let's look at what are the parts of a syllable. Syllables are split mainly into their onset and their rhyme. So the onset is whichever consonants you have that might come before the vowel of the syllable. So in the word cat, the K would inhabit in the, would be in the onset. In the syllable sing, the S would be in the onset. In the syllable sprint, the S, P, and R would be assigned to the onset. And in the syllable flounce, which as you can see here is one syllable transcribed in IPA, flounce, the F, L would be in the onset. So we have this part, and then the second part of the syllable is the rhyme, which is itself divided into two more subcomponents the nucleus of the syllable and the coda of the syllable. So in these syllables, the nucleus is either the vowel or the diphthong. So in English, diphthongs are assumed to be whole phonemes. So the whole diphthong can occupy the nucleus position. 
So in cat, the nucleus is the vowel e. In sing and sprints, it's the vowel e. And in flounce, it's the diphthong ow, which again in English we assume to be a single unit. So we have the nucleus and then the coda of the syllables would be whatever consonants and glides we have after the nucleus, after the vowel, I'm sorry. So in cat, the T would be assigned to the coda. In sing, the, eng the engma, the nasal velar, would be assigned to the coda. In sprints, all of these, the N, T, and S, would be in the coda. And in flounce, the N and the S, which come after the nucleus, are assigned to the coda as well. So these are the parts of a syllable. And by the way, you do not, when you have a syllable, you only need a nucleus. But sometimes you can have syllables without onsets and without codas. So for example, the, word, the syllable each has a nucleus, which is the, con the vowel, and a coda, which is the final consonant, each. But the syllable does not have an onset because there's no consonants before the vowel. Likewise, the word me has an onset and a rhyme with a nucleus, but it does not have a coda because there are no consonants after the vowel e in me. Finally, again, the only part you really need is the nucleus. So the word I has the diphthong I in it, and it doesn't have any consonants either before or after it. So the syllable is just a rhyme with a nucleus, which is I. How do we know all these things exist? How do we know that the brain is actually splitting things into onsets and rhymes and nuclei and codas? Because these components participate in phonological processes. And one of the most interesting ones is speech errors. So have you ever tried to talk like so fast that you end up like mashing two words together? For example, you try to say person and then try to say people at the same time and you end up with something like purple. So your brain is, try, uh, is trying to say both at the same time and then the components of the word sort of get meshed together. But because we get the first syllable and of the first word and the second syllable of the second word, we know that these words were split in syllables so that these components, when the words uh, collided, these two components were separated from the other syllables in the word and they were the ones who survived. So we have speech errors where we scramble syllables, but we also have speech errors where what we scramble are onsets. For example, uh, there's people who have uh, detected, who have observed others try to say black boxes and instead say black blocks, where what you scramble is the onset of the first syllable. So we know that in their minds, they must have, they must have been splitting the onset from the rhyme so that the onset survived the collision of the two words. I'm sorry, this, these two words did not collide. So the onset of one word was copied into the other one. But this means that the onset existed as its own unit, which could be copied. We also see this when two uh, segments switch places, like in Lunder and Lightning. <laughs> so because they switched places, it must, means, it must mean that onsets exist because they are units that can be switched around. Likewise with rhymes. If we try to see, say nightlife and end up with knife light, it means that there were rhymes separated from the onsets and then these rhymes move around. As a matter of fact, take a look at night life and then knife light. The N and the L, the onsets remained in place. It was the rhymes that switched. So the Onsets and the rhymes must be separated in people's minds. Finally, you can just have a nucleus move around, uh, going from ad hoc to odd hack, where the nucleus and the codas were separated, the codas stayed in place, and the nuclei switched around. So that's how we know that these objects actually exist in people's minds, because they uh, appear to be separated, and then people appear to be uh, juggling them around and this happens in speech errors 
So in summary, words are split into syllables, as you've known from school. And English does have stressed syllables. It also has secondary stress. But here we looked at uh, the subcomponents of syllables. Syllables have onsets, and they have rhymes, which are composed of nuclei and codas. And we know these are real because we see them in speech errors, for example. In the next video, we will look at how languages built their syllable, their syllables.